As us riders grow and change, so do our bikes to meet our needs. And here's my special edition Wobby special with chrome lugs. Thanks to Wobby for sponsoring this video. Check them out linked in the description if you want a sick bike just like mine. This is the most unfixy iteration of my bike ever since I built up my All City Nature Boy to just be a straight up fixed gear townie bike. I know I'm not getting a ton of fixy points with this build if my Instagram engagement is any indication. It's like once you take drop bars off of your bike you get like 50% less likes on your post, not even exaggerating. I'm at the point in my life where I don't really care to do what's cool and trendy and to stick to tradition and what's proper. And I've realized as I'm getting older, I care less about other people's opinions and I just do what I enjoy. Part of it, my bike is a little grimy and dusty and rusty because uh, I actually ride my bike rain or shine, and I can't be bothered to have it spick and span sparkling clean every single time I shoot a video. What you're getting today is the authentic experience. This is what my bike looks like most of the time. So this is my Wobby Special, Gary H. Winkle. Limited edition with the beautiful chrome lugs. Wobby and I have been working on these things for the past like year and a half, to two years, and they're finally a thing. I think they sold out though, so Thanks to everybody that bought one. I hope you're really enjoying it as much as I am because they're really sick bikes. We're probably not going to do them again because it was extremely labor intensive and a lot of back and forth and it was it was a pain in the butt to put it uh, lightly. <laughs> purple is just hands down the best color for the bike. I really enjoy purple bikes. My favorite color, of course. And there's also a lot of practical benefits to having a purple bike. Like, I shoot my bike a lot photos video and purple is perhaps the least common color in a background so it really pops out against any background it's complementary with green it's complementary with yellow orange brown it just stands out and it's really easy to shoot on top of just looking really sick really iconic and just i look at my bike and i immediately know this is my bike. Not only do they do chrome lugs, which is near impossible to find on any production bike, now these days, if you want chrome lugs on a bike, you're looking at vintage or you're looking at a super expensive, you know, two to three thousand dollar custom steel frame set. And Wobby was able to get the price point down to under a grand, which is amazing, while also polishing a lot of the points that most builders just don't even bother with, like the bottom bracket lug, the track end, and even the dropouts in the fork, which you can't even see when you have a wheel installed, just gives that, that little extra special flavor and really makes it feel like it's something unique and that a lot of love was poured into these frame sets. This is something I learned after visiting the Wabi factory here in Taiwan. There's a few reasons why you don't see a lot of chrome lug frame sets anymore. Number one, it's a lot cheaper and a lot more profitable to produce a TIG welded frame set. And especially if you're a brand that can command a high price from a TIG welded frame set, you're going to make a lot more money off of those. With that said though, lugs are still, in my eyes, a much prettier way to construct a bike and a lot stronger way to construct a bike, even though its strength isn't something that you're going to benefit in your day-to-day -day riding. But also there's two ways to chrome lugs. The first is a chemical process where elements will bind themselves essentially to the steel of the lug and they don't do that anymore in Taiwan because it's very bad for the environment so all of those factories had to shut down. The second way to make chrome lugs is literally just hand polishing the lugs until they shine and that's what Wabi did here with these chrome lug frame sets and that's why People don't really make these anymore. <laughs> but the fact that I have one, like this is just my dream bike. There's really nothing left for me to desire in my fixed gear. I've recently swapped to a set of unconventional handlebars. Don't get me wrong, I love drop bars. And if I could only have one pair of handlebars, it would be my 42 centimeter Nitto noodles. But I can have multiple handlebars and it's just fun to change things up and to do things that not a lot of people do and to try things out and see if they work out. So right now on here I have a set of Nitto Albus dash bars. 
I think they're 55 centimeter. They're the heat treated aluminum ones designed by Rivendell in California, made by Nitto in Tokyo. It's some of the finest handlebars that money can buy. I wanted to switch to sweatback style alt bars because I've, I've used them before and they're super fun to ride and really comfortable and not all that much slower if they're even slower at all. And also I am currently living in Taichung, Taiwan, which is basically like the Chicago of Taiwan if Chicago were four times as dense. <laughs> so I'm not really getting in the drops at all. But don't be fooled, just because these look like, you know, swept back townie bars, they're actually surprisingly aggressive. Like, I have to at least ride around 15 miles per hour, or that's like 25 kilometers per hour, which isn't super fast but you don't want to be cruising on these because it gets pretty uncomfortable. Now, a lot of people hate these handlebars. They have a very particular way that they want to be fitted, which is as tall as the saddle and with a really short stem, and it ends up looking really goofy. So I wanted to try something that people don't typically try, which is a slammed negative 70 degree stem and see if it works out. And to my surprise, all the hand positions, as long as I'm riding about 15 or more miles per hour, which I do most of the time, it's kind of hard here though to keep up a speed and to keep up a flow because it is so dense and the lights aren't freaking timed. You get one red light and then you get a green and then it's another red light a block later. It's a mess. But the hand positions are pretty comfortable. This is the main hand position out back and you can even get into these hooks here and bend your elbows to get nice and arrow. And I would even say because there's a drop, you can see there's a slight drop. It's about a one centimeter drop. It's so subtle, but it's there and you can feel it. This is the main hand position, but it's, I would say even more aggressive than the hoods position in drop bars. They're fun. It's a nice little mix up and they're super great for climbing. Not super great for skidding, because if you pull your leg, you could hit the handlebar, <laughs> and it's a little scary. Uh, so I'll be sure to do a full review once I put some more miles on these things. But up in the front of my bike, I also have a head unit. Even though I'm not a tryhard, I don't care about stats and beating personal records and making it on the little birds on Strava. I got this thing because I travel a lot. I go to a lot of cities where I don't know how to get around and I don't want to keep pulling out my phone to look up Google Maps to see if I'm going the right direction. And it's also good to have because I host a lot of group rides and I say, oh yeah, we're going to be riding at like 15 miles an hour. And previously I didn't have a computer, a head unit or anything. I just have to look at my Strava and just guess how fast I'm going after the ride. and. It always says like, oh, oh, you ride like 14 to 15 mile per hour average. So in my mind, I was like, okay, so I'm riding like 15 miles per hour once I'm up to speed probably. But then once I started hosting group rides, everybody was like, Zach, can we please slow down? We're doing like 20 right now. This is not 15. So I got the head unit. Lo and behold, once I am up to speed, it does say usually like between 18 to 22 miles per hour once I'm up to speed and maintaining that speed, I can now actually host group rides at 15 miles per hour. <laughs> and then underneath this out front mount that I just you know, got one from Amazon where the stem bolts thread into so it doesn't take up any uh, real estate on your handlebars for your hand positions, which is you know, perfect for me because these are very bendy bars. They don't have a lot of flat area for your accessories. You can also mount a headlight underneath to keep the cockpit nice and tidy. And for the stem, it's a Nitto UI86BX 26.0 stem. And I have the handlebars shimmed with a Nitto 25.4 to 26.0 shim. And my bars are wrapped in some Brooks Cambium faux leather tape and end it off with uh, some cork from a wine bottle because the uh, bar ends that are supplied with handlebar tape now are meant for 31.8 bars and like I, you, they don't fit. They don't fit. And so every time I get a new pair of handlebars, I have to buy some Nitto bar ends to 
plug them up. It's a bit annoying. These are just temporary. I'm not a huge like wine hipster or anything like that. I am still fixie foo at heart. Slam stem fork cuts all the way down except for this little five millimeter spacer on top. I just like how that looks mostly and it's also easier to, to press the bearings in when you have a spacer between the top cap and the star nut and stem. I don't know why. It just works out that way in my experience. Although it's a very aggressive fit, it still fits me properly. I'm still plenty comfortable, even with a bunch of gear on my back. I had to work my way up to having my stem this low and cut between like five to 10 millimeters at a time, lowering it, lowering it until I finally was able to get it slammed. Because if you're slamming your stem and you're not strong enough rider and you can't support pushing hard on the pedals to take the weight off of your wrists and shoulders, you're gonna not enjoy your bike and yeah that was stupid don't don't just go whole hog and slam your stem you gotta you gotta work your way to it my saddle it's a brook swift so i've been riding it for the past five and a half years now and i have an estimated 15,000 miles on it it's just something that i don't have to think about the saddle is the last piece of your bike that you want to be thinking about because if you're having saddle pain, you're not having fun. And I've ridden it so much and the way it patinas is just really beautiful to me. You can see that the, the Brooks Swift embossing has <laughs> faded a lot just from a lot of rubbing and going through a lot of seasons. And I've had to tension the nose tension bolt probably about once every year. And I'm about halfway through the tension bolt, so, once I do get through it in perhaps another five years, then I'll have to do one of those hacky things where you have to like drill the leather and then tie it with some string or yarn or whatever to keep the leather tension. But so far I've been super happy with it. One of my best bike purchases I've ever made. Uh, the only weird thing about the Brooks saddles, uh, barring the C17, they're more modern, modern saddles, the Cambium line, is that they have really short rails. These were designed in the 1800s. The design has not changed at all since the 1800s. And they were designed for bikes that had more relaxed C2 bangles. So they didn't need to have their rails as long as more modern and more aggressive geometries. Because of that, if you want it to fit properly, you need to get a seat post with a longer setback. And the only <coughs> two bolt seat post that I liked, two bolt seat posts, came in black, doesn't look ugly, is the Paul Tall and Handsome seat post, which is what I'm running on my bike. It hurts a lot to buy it because it's like a 200 freaking dollar seat post, but at the very least, it's made right up the street from my hometown in Chico, California. So it feels good to support some local businesses that make some really quite exquisite bike products. Well designed and solves a problem that a lot of people have. And a seat post that was also tall enough because I have really long legs. I have a 58 centimeter frame and I still have like two fists worth of seat post. Like, yeah, I ju I'm just a, a lanky dude. And <laughs> it was the only one that checked all the boxes. The taillight that I've been using for the past year is a Magic Shine taillight, and I've been using it mostly because it is hands down the coolest, cleanest looking taillight available today. It just tucks underneath your saddle. You can leave it on the bike and not have to worry about anybody stealing it. Except this taillight has one fatal flaw. It just does not hold its battery. Half of the time I try to turn on this taillight, it's just dead. Even if I completely charged it, didn't use it at all. If it's been sitting for a few days, it will just be completely drained, completely dead. And there goes my peace of mind of not being hit by a car when I'm trying to ride home at night. All I can say is tomorrow, I will be buying a new taillight to replace this one, as cool as it does look. And Magic Shine, please get your together. This is the 2.0 version of this taillight and it's still draining battery. Also, for the love of God, please make all of your lights USB-C. That goes for every light company. Thank you. Moving down, we have the Made in the USA stainless steel king cages. They look really sick. They hold my bottles well. They give me American-made fixie points, which is something that I appreciate. And speaking of American-made, it's so hot in Taiwan, dude. You gotta have at least one water bottle on your bike at all times. 
and I have my tap water bottle, which I'm no longer selling. Vegan, organic, gluten-free, BPA-free, actually, tap water bottle. Thanks to everybody that bought one. We made 100, we sold them all. Thank you. The pedals are MKS GR10s. Um, GR10 for, you know, 10 and up in men's shoe sizes. Super comfortable, best pedals I've ever used. Uh, I like using just toe clips and straps instead of clipless because I like wearing different shoes sometimes and I like to walk after I park my bike sometimes. <laughs> Could you imagine that? And I have uh, Toshi double straps, best straps I've ever used. Super comfortable, super durable, super reliable. The only complaints with them is, well one, they don't make them anymore because I guess not a whole lot of people had a hundred plus dollars, hundred fifty dollars or whatever it costs to buy a set of toe straps for their fixed gear. <laughs> Who would have thought? Um, but they also, they bleed a lot in the rain, which is just something that's inherent to dyed leather. It's, the dye bleeds onto my shoes, so all of my shoes have like red stripes at the toes. Not a huge deal, and it's just become part of my vibe and my outfits. And the cages are all city nylon cages, which I believe, oh yes, they are made by CKC in Taiwan, which is just like a, an OEM manufacturer. And I have taken off the all city logo with some acetone, just cause like, I don't, I don't wanna be looking at logos. <laughs> I now use plastic cages instead of metal cages because I ride in sneakers, obviously. If you're having cages on your bike, you're probably riding in sneakers. And metal cages just scuff up shoes really badly. I have a pair of fancy Red Wing boots that I want scuffed up, and plastic cages are just better. Also, I snap toe cages probably like once a year, and I have had this pair of uh, nylon cages for about two years now. I've had no issues with it. So they're just more durable, don't scuff up your shoes as badly. They still do a little bit, and they don't look as cool, but that's a trade-off that I'm willing to take. They're also not as stiff, but it's something that you get over really fast. And I had to uh, almost completely back off the straps, because I just recently got these super sick, super comfortable uh, Converse boots. It's just my other shoes are going to be a little loose in the straps now, but it's, it's whatever, it's not a big deal. My all-time favorite cranks, Sugino 75s, spared no expense on my bike and uh they just look really sick they're super stiff super reliable the 144 bcd track standard has access to all the great chain rings and super good bottom brackets i actually got lucky because i paid for these full retail uh 250 dollars for the arms could you believe it yeah it was pre-covid i felt so bad for just like spending so much money on my bike because it's really not necessary it's just for the fixie points like the stock wabi crank set that i was riding made by andile here in taiwan they ride just as nicely if i'm being completely honest they just didn't look as nice didn't have that fit and finish but yeah now i'm feeling like a savvy investor with the bike prices today <laughs> the Sugino 70 five prices just completely skyrocketing and i am currently using the sugino 75 bottom bracket the njs one that i made a whole video on and why it's like an abusive relationship riding them and i did swap it out with a phil wood bottom bracket which is oh that's oh perfection it's just that the bearings in them were shot i needed to get them replaced they were super crunchy and i just didn't have time so, and i was coming here to taiwan so I'll just get those bearings in place. But you know, that's the beauty of having something that's very modular, serviceable, and just very old school style like the Sugino 75 bottom bracket. Yes, it's a big pain in the butt. And yes, it doesn't always work and it takes a very good mechanic to set it up properly. But once you do, I haven't had any problems with it so far. Just sometimes it gets a little clicky in the rain. Um, not a huge problem for me. I've learned to ignore it at this point. But just the thing, that's the thing, it just, it lasts forever. It's evergreen, it's always going to work. You don't have to buy replacement parts for it if you maintain it and install it properly. 
And that's the beauty of it. Again, I still don't like it. It still kind of feels like an abusive relationship, but I'm using it for the time being for the next few months until I can get new bearings for my Phil Wood bottom bracket that is sitting in a parts bin in California right now. <laughs> my chain ring is the Alter Shark chain ring in this hard anodized bronze and 47 tooth. Before that, I was using an a a r r and chain what, what, i don't know how to pronounce it it's been like 10 12 13 years i still don't know how to pronounce arn a a ron whatever those are great chain rings too it's just that uh, mine wore out it was like the first gen one that was made in massachusetts and i bought it used from navis here in taiwan and it lasted about four years after that maybe three because i used another altar chain ring whatever <laughs> I got a lot of miles out of it. I love that chain ring, but I went with the altar because my buddy Hao Xiang, the owner of Faith Gear, is buddies with the owner of Altar Cycles. So he got the hookup and I can get chain rings from them. Like I'm going to take free chain rings, especially if they're super sick chain rings. I love the arm chain rings. It's just that, you know, the hipster in me is like, Man, these used to be so underground, but now they're so mainstream and everybody has them on their fixie. I want to get something else. I really enjoy the hard anodized bronze complements the frame set and pops off of the purple really nicely and complements the uh, peregrine similar spokes, which we will get to. Don't worry, we're getting there. My rear cog is a white industries 17 tooth proprietary splined interface that has absolutely no threads so that you do not strip your hub and render a perfectly good wheel useless. 4717 hits that sweet spot for you can ride just about anything that you'd probably be riding. Like, of course you're not mountain biking on this, but it's like if you're mountain biking on a fixie, you probably need to see a psychologist or end up in the hospital and learn a lesson either way. But because Taiwan is so dense, it's also extremely mountainous. I actually find that I could comfortably go lower, even when I'm just riding around traffic because it's so much stop and go, stop and go. I could even go down to like the altar, um, 43 tooth or 42 tooth chain ring and be perfectly comfortable or up my cog up to a 19 tooth right now I'm at the sweet spot gear ratio pretty great for Almost anything and the chain is an Izumi tough guard chain Anti-rust I was riding Izumi super toughness chains previously And I find that they just get so rusty so easily even just the slightest amount of humidity in the air would cause it to rust or just riding through a puddle those chains would rust it was just kind of annoying and i got this chain when i was in michigan riding in the snow and the salt and the izumi super toughness sadly just could not hang as sick as those chains look the silver chain completely fine nothing to write home about but i'll will report back to you on how well it does not rust so far i've been riding in the rain and it's not rusting wow it's almost like they told the truth in their advertising. And the wheels are something that I decided to treat myself on this year after having some problems with uh, a previous uh, H plus N archetype wheel set, laced the Suzu hubs. And I just wanted to get a wheel set that I could have for the rest of my life or until they're stolen, unfortunately. And it's something I just don't have to worry about and something that's still super high quality and something I could be proud to ride. So these wheels were built by my local bike shop in my hometown of Sacramento, California, Velotrap. Uh, Andron, the owner, built them himself. And that's just really special to me, to knowing that I have wheels that somebody that I know, somebody that I ride with, that I hang out with, that I'm drinking beers with and played Smash Bros with, <laughs> built my wheels by hand. They're not just built by some machine off in, here in Taiwan. <laughs> not that that's a bad thing, but it's just something special. Velocity A23s, made in the USA, in the raw silver finish, something that H plus on archetypes don't have. They're also tubeless compatible, another leg up on the H plus on archetypes, and they're made in the USA instead of China. They're also cheaper than archetypes. It's almost like these are the better rim. Why don't more people ride these? I don't know. <laughs> and the hubs are White Industries track hubs that I specifically went for because of the splined interface. It's something unique to the White Industries hubs. And yeah, it's a little annoying that you have to use proprietary cogs and only buy White Industries cogs, but the chain whip is the most archaic, outdated, pain in the butt tool ever on the bike. And eliminating the need for that tool 
just makes working on my bike and cleaning out my cog and my hub a lot more manageable, a lot more fun, a lot easier, accessible. It's just better. This is just a better design than threading on a cog onto a hub because there's absolutely no threads to get stripped and no wheel. And I've had cogs get seized onto hubs before, onto the threads. And those rear, that rear wheel is just completely useless now, which is a real shame. I can take it to a shop and have it dremeled off and maybe you might damage the threads, but it's just, why? Why are we dealing with this? This is just a better design. And it also looks super sick. And I really quite enjoy the uh, gold, golden bronzish nuts. They have quite faded after lots of uh, salty, slushy riding in Michigan, uh, but still looks super great. And I went with the Hoshi, made in Japan, Simworks Peregrine spokes and brass nipples, just to give it that extra pop off of uh, my purple frame set. And the tires, these are the best tires I've ever used. Before, um, I was using, uh, what are they called? They always change their name. Compass? No. Grand Broad? No. Renayers. Renayers 32C and 35C tires. Those are uh, I have a whole video about it, I'm not going to belabor the point here. Now I'm on Continental Grand Prix 5000, STR is the name. I set them up myself, tubeless. The great advantage that I find of riding tubeless is you can ride really nice race tires uh, without having fears of getting an excessive amount of punctures. Still no punctures on it, they're super easy to install. Just they, they're one of those tires that just hold air even without any sealant and they don't leak air as much as the uh, Grand Bois, Compass, Rene Earth, whatever you want to call them tires. I've been loving these. They're also super grippy, a lot more confidence inspiring in the corners than any other tire that I've used and super, super fast. About just as fast as the fastest tires I've ever tried, which are those tires that I hate. The tires are 32C to the biggest tire that my frame set can fit. And I find that it's the sweet spot. I ride about 90% paved, probably 98% paved. So uh, 32C is just big enough where I can handle mud and snow and slush and gravel pretty comfortably, pretty confidently, while still being super fast and grippy and confidence inspiring on the road. And because it's super rainy, and sticky and swampy <laughs> in Taiwan. I have a SKS S board in the front, SKS S blade in the rear, clip on fenders on and off, just super easy, no tools. And they have really great coverage, probably the best coverage from the rain that you can get without going for full fenders. And I just keep them on my bike right now because the weather here is very unpredictable. You know, it, it was sunny at, at the start of this video, and now it's rain clouds covering my head at the end of recording this video. It could be heavy rain one hour, completely sunny the next hour, then heavy rain again the next hour. It just, it just makes riding my bike easier, even though it, you know, detracts from the fixie points and the coolness of my bike. And I also just keep the uh, Brooks saddle cover on my bike most of the time here. It's just what you gotta do if you wanna be able to hang and ride your bike easily. And if you're wondering what black magic is allowing my bike to stand up completely on its own for this whole video, the answer is the most unfixy thing that I have on my bike, which is a kickstand. A Greenfield kickstand with special hardware so that bikes, even without a mounting plate under in the rear triangle, can have a kickstand and experience the full bliss and convenience that is being able to prop up your bike without a wall, a tree, or a curb. <laughs> it's something that I actually am enjoying quite a lot, but it's not without its problems. It turns out the chain stays on fixed gears. They're usually pretty short. And because of that, with my big, you know, clown feet, <laughs> when I backpedal or skid, a lot of times I'm, I'm flicking my left foot inwards and I will, my shoe will sometimes get caught on the kickstand, which is a little spooky, uh, but I'm learning to change my riding habits so that I can safely ride with the kickstand and not clip it 
and have my shoe torn off my foot every time I try to skid. I unironically put the kickstand on my bike because Taiwan is just so freaking dense. Most of the times, there is not a place to park your bike. They don't have a bike rack. They don't have a wall. People get so anal about rules here and every like building has different rules and different hours of when you can do things and they expect every single person to interact with that building to know them so there are times where it's like you'll lean your building on a wall and a security guard will come out yelling at you threatening to call the cops on you and confiscate your bike because you leaned your bike against the wall of their building like it's insane so instead of dealing with that and instead of hunting around for 10 to 15 minutes every time I try to go somewhere to park my bike. I just got a kickstand. I park it where the scooters go because everybody rides a scooter here. It's been great. Like, it's, it's so dense. There isn't bike parking, it just doesn't exist. And because scooters are so popular here and because cycling, not, not cycling, because riding a bike is such an integral part of life in Taiwan, Everybody has a kickstand on their bike. It's just the metagame here that you gotta play. There's not bike racks. It's so safe here that I just free lock my bike anywhere with my kickstand. Nobody touches it, nobody steals it, nobody cares as long as it's not in somebody's way. With that said though, once I go back to the United States where we have walls and bike racks and need to lock our bikes to immovable objects, the kickstand is coming off and right now, I'm loving it. <laughs> Unironically loving the kickstand. It's also great just to shoot videos. It's so much easier. I can shoot videos anywhere now. I don't need to find a, a wall with a nice background or anything like that. I just shoot. <laughs> Hopefully that answers any questions that you guys have about my bike. Uh, everything I choose on it, I choose for a very specific reason. What's best for me might not be what's best for you, but I have a lot of fun on this thing. It serves me very well. And lately I've been getting into wackier things which has been surprisingly fun. And that's what biking is all about. Fixie famous shoutouts to Julian Corona, Brandon Black, Maya Perez, Ted Angie, and Brent David for helping to make these Fix Your videos possible through their support on Patreon. Remember that life is short, but don't make it shorter, so be sure to ride your bike every day to be reasonably dangerous.